so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. This is great. I, I have to tell you, it's not only great, but I was telling you before we got started, a little emotional for me because I remember standing on a street corner calling you when I was a brand new founder and you were so welcoming and so kind and so thoughtful. And you also were in my interview for 500 startups and, and just seeing you in the room and, and knowing you that we were there helped me feel more confident to be in that space. So I just wanted to publicly thank you for that because you've meant so much to me as a mentor, but just a guiding light. And I know I'm not the only person who feels that way. I appreciate that. I mean, I, you know, I try to enter the room and bring people in with me and, you know, I hope that everyone feels that way. Yes, ma'am. You do, you do, you do. So let's talk a little bit more about you. You have this incredible bio, but we'd love to hear just a, a bit about who was Monique before she got into these streets. Okay. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what your life was like before you got into uh, the business of venture capital and startups. Yeah, I grew up in a small rural, rural town in the middle of Florida. Um, the, the big town next to my small town is called Ocala, but you know, I grew up in a very tiny town. I actually lived a lot of uh, my early days on, on a farm. And um, you know, I grew up in a place that you would not ever hear about venture capital or Silicon Valley or any of those sorts of things. But um, you know, as I was growing up, I was really interested in computers and my parents bought me a computer when I was very young and they would drive me 20 miles into town to take a computer class. And <laughs> I was just, um, you know, I really appreciate that, that, that they, you know, uh, encouraged that level of interest in something that was still relatively new. I mean, we're talking about like the first Apple computer, like I've, I've been on the internet for a very long time. <laughs> Just a minute. Okay. But she looks like she, you know, she takes care. Okay. She takes care. <laughs> a little skincare. Um, and, you know, I, I grew up in that rural environment and, um, you know, didn't know anything about venture capital, but knew I was really interested in computers and science and things like that. Um, as I kind of moved into high school, like a lot of, a lot of girls, I kind of fell out of um, sort of the, the, computer sciences because we didn't have computer science at my high school. And so, um, you know, but then I kind of like picked it back up on my own and was like building these very early janky HTML websites and, you know, eventually, um, you know, got very into building things on the internet and just figuring out how to make those work. Um, and that's kind of what led me down the path of like startups and internet and, you know, eventually led me into venture capital. I, I just want to ask how many other people in the chat, I see that Dana says I did those too. I also <laughs> did that little HTML, a little MySpace, right? You were exactly. like, I'm so savvy. I can change the font. My background is black and the <laughs> font is like uh, neon green. <laughs> yeah. I feel that. But I come from a background of farmers and small business owners and um, definitely not people who knew what venture capital was. There no, I'm the only VC in my family. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of a testament to the path that you can take that I'm able to be here now as a VC who runs her own fund. She said, running my own fund, y'all. I, I just want to share with you, Monique, that resonates with me so much. I'm from a really small town in Southwest Missouri, and I'm so grateful for that experience and that background because I spent so much time outside and playing with um, playing sports. And my, my dad was a fish biologist and my mother uh, started her own sewing business. And again, it's like what your parents give you access to and expose you to, uh, you know, I think really helps you be curious about what's possible. And it sounds like your parents gave you access to a lot of really cool opportunities that you can continue to follow your curiosity. And I would say you're still following your curiosity, right? Even with this white paper that we're about to dig into. So I'm curious from your perspective, you you really look at big trends that are happening and try to, to write about, speak about what's interesting to you. What has piqued your interest in the female economy? Why write about it? Yeah. So you know, as, as you mentioned, I was a venture partner at 500 Startups, and that's really, really where I started my career in investing. And uh, I was investing in my, the first company that I invested in at 500 Startups was Blavity, um, which is- <laughs> And if people don't know, tell us about Blavity, okay? Yes. Tell us about which Blavity. Is, uh, now one of the biggest, the biggest media platforms for Black 
uh, millennials and Gen Z. And, um, and I also invested in a company called Silver Nest, which was one of the early aging companies. And, and I'm an investor in Minted Cosmetics, a beauty brand. And so I had always been investing in these areas of demographic change, but I had not yet defined it as that. I hadn't kind of crystallized that. It takes a little while for you know, your focus to crystallize as an investor. And when I sort of look back at my track record, I, I came to the aha moment that I was always investing in demographic change. And part of that demographic change is watching the growth of the female economy and watching how companies um, you know, are now growing based on the female dollar to these billion dollar plus outcomes. That's right. I actually want to dig into what you just said a, a second ago about how when you looked back at your track record, you had this aha moment that it was about demographic shifts and demographic change. Was this like a, what triggered that reflection or did it just come all, all of a sudden, like where did that come from? Well, when you decide to start a fund, you sort of need to kind of like look back at what you've done and figure out what is it you're trying to say to the world. Uh, and, you know, really your fund strategy is your history. It's like, what are people, LPs, the limited partners who invest in funds, what are they going to uh, basically essentially pay you to do, to do next? They're going to pay you to do the thing that you've been successful at doing. And so the thing I had been successful at doing was really demographic change investing. And I knew that that demographic change investing was a big deal and that it would drive, that it will drive companies for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And if I was going to build a firm that had a platform for the next, you know, 30 plus years, then that's what I needed to be building. I love this so much. And, and folks, I'm going to try and dig into places where Modi can also demonstrate how she's come to these conclusions. So it's not just the insights that she's come to, but I also want to a peek uh, behind the curtain at, at Monique's thought process for people who are investors in the audience or even founders who want to better understand how investors think. So let's get to it, folks. Let's start talking about this white paper. So finding alpha about, first of all, it's one of my favorite white papers. I think I tell everybody about it. I was on the phone talking to a family member who blessed them, was like, okay, I guess we're, we're going to talk about this right now, but okay. And I'm like, listen, these stats are wild. So I want to hear, why did you decide to write this white paper? There's so many different ways that you could have done this, but you did it in this beautiful piece of content that I think is so helpful. So talk to us about your why. So I think that over the years, people have talked about the female economy in terms of um, female founders. And that is a really important conversation, obviously. Um, but they haven't often dug into the economic opportunity, not just with female founders, but also with female consumers, right? And I think if you're going to stand up a fund, a firm, um, you know, build a company, I think you really have to make the economic argument for why you're investing in the way that you're investing or why you're building in the way that you're building. And I really wanted to use this paper, white paper, and put it out there for the world as like, look, there is an economic opportunity here that I am going after at Cake Ventures. I think there's an economic opportunity that a lot of founders, many of them female founders, um, are going after and that they see very clearly. And I want it to give people, investors and founders, the data that backs up their you know, desire and their vision to invest in these categories. Because otherwise, people uh, are very easy to dismiss it as, oh, this is DEI investing, or this is diversity, or, you know, and I hate the way that this is, like, it, this incenses me, but uh, they dis dismiss things as like, oh, you're you're going woke or whatever. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate hate that. How but... do you feel about it, Monique? I feel like it's not clear. <laughs> <laughs> hate how they've like taken that word and like turned it into something else. But you know, uh, I think you know, as we go out into the world and we talk about our companies and our 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 funds and our firms, we have to be armed with kind of this data driven approach to the economic opportunity that is going to make us all a lot of money. I, this is the part that I'm so excited about is the framing of um, the opportunity here that 
again, you'd use this term shrinking and pinking, which I think is so helpful. And all of a sudden I could see it everywhere when I heard this term. Could you talk to us about what this term means? Because I think it really is such a great catalyst for this conversation today. Yeah. I mean, I didn't come up with that phrase. It's been around for, for quite a while, but there's this idea of, especially within, it started within consumer goods where you would just take uh, the male version of the razor and you would shrink it to a smaller size and then make it pink. And then that was your female version, right? As opposed to building something from first principles and thinking about the ways that women may use a product differently or may have different needs from a product. They would just shrink it and pink it and put it in a new package. And now that became, you know, the, the female version that you, that you buy on the shelves. And you can certainly see this in technology also. Um, and I think that those companies to me are less interesting and they're less successful because they're not operating from first principles of, you know, understanding your customer, understanding your consumer, understanding how she is using something differently, understanding how her problem shows up differently. Um, and I think that's a real missed opportunity. And that's not to say that every product should be exclusively slanted to a female user. In fact, most of the time it shouldn't be. But you really should be thinking about how the different consumers will use your product and then uh, re-engineering it so that it works for more people. I love the, the way you talk about how we should use first principles and how we should just design to solve problems for people. And that often the solutions don't need to be gendered. And so I'm curious if you could dig into this a little bit more, because I think this is also so relevant to where our culture is headed um, around not needing to gender all of these different products. Yeah, I do really struggle with companies that are unnecessarily gendered. And, you know, I think some companies are, you know, you have a, you know, you have a natural gendering lens, right? So if you look at companies like Skims, Glossier, Minted Cosmetics, Fenty Beauty, um, you know, many of those are, are billion dollar plus companies, ma massive companies, unicorns, very successful. Those have a natural gendering to them right? Who uses Spanx or who uses Skims? Who uses Fenty Beauty? Who buys Savage X Fenty Lingerie? Um, and so that is a natural gating. What I often see is this unnatural gating of a product to say, okay, we're, we're building, um, we're, we're, we're building Uber for women or we're building Uber for Latinos. Uber for Latinos is just, is just Uber. Right. And unfortunately, what that does is shrinks your TAM, your total addressable market, and makes it less likely um, that you're going to see sort of this like explosive success. Now, are you potentially identifying a gap in the product that, you know, women in particular experience or Latinos in particular experience or older people in particular experience? Sure. Those are real. Those are real product level gaps. But you have to go product level and then solve for, um, you know, sometimes the most uh, the the people who experience the problem the most, and then create a product that has a very large TAM total addressable market in order to really create something um, big and impactful. I love it. I, I want to move into the the power of women in the economy. And a fact that isn't surprising, but is very powerful is that women make 85% of day-to-day -day spending decisions. What makes this stat so powerful to you and, and how can investors and founders use this information as they make decisions? So I think what makes it really powerful for me is, is uh, what happens when you back into that number. So more than half of uh, college students on college campuses right now are women. And um, <laughs> so women have become like this highly educated part of the workforce. And so, and while overall enrollment in the US university is, is dropping, over 70% of that drop is male students. And if that trend continues, two women will earn a degree for every one man. Right. So women are coming out of universities and colleges 
highly educated, entering the workforce, and then, you know, having, you know, much higher earning power than ever before. And as they have that higher earning power, they then become head of household, they're making the financial decisions, they're making the buying decisions, they're buying the houses, right? <laughs> Um, and so that's how you kind of back into the impact of that number and where it comes from and how it impacts not just, you know, this one person, this one woman, but also impacts the family um, and, you know, men in general are impacted by that, by those stats as well. So I, I love that you talk about this transit again, another demographic transition, right? More women in college than men, uh, more women holding degrees than men. I also want to talk about how this impacts the unicorns who have been growing up in the last decade. So 85% of that day-to-day -day spending that we just talked about has driven some major unicorns that you mentioned earlier. And as you explained in the paper, a number of publicly held unicorns and multi-billion dollar market cap public companies can attribute their growth to a powerful and engaged female consumer base. So what can companies that aspire to become unicorns glean from companies like Teladoc or Fair or some of the other others that you mentioned earlier? You know, I think the thing to be gleaned is that, so Teladoc um, powers telehealth in the healthcare space, right? Um, Matt, we had a massive uh, telehealth boom post during and post COVID, um, and it's not going to stop. A lot of that dr was driven by uh, female healthcare, um, not just women's health, but, you know, the usage of women around healthcare. Women go to the doctor and use healthcare just more than men. Um, and so a lot of that, a lot of that explosive growth drives companies like Teladoc to these billion dollar plus, um, I think their, their uh, market cap is like a 4 billion plus market cap, right? And so you don't have to be a company that is just focused on saying, okay, we are going to do a very woman focused and woman centered thing because you're able to, to see the influence of women in so many different categories and in so many different ways that you can build these massive companies on top of these demographic changes that you would never even thought of before. Of course, you're gonna think of the glossiers of the world. Of course, you're gonna think of the honest codes of the world. And those are really important companies too. But if you look at Teladoc and Bright Horizons and FAIR, which isn't public yet, but you know, very large private company, you see how women have influenced these companies over time and how the influence just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and making bigger and bigger companies. And I, I, I wanna talk also about, again, like counter, um, comparing this to that insight you brought up earlier, which is that some investors still think that women's health, for example, is a niche industry, yeah. which is wild to me because you you shared some really important stats there about how women are are engaging with healthcare more often. Um, they're often making healthcare decisions for their entire family. And so in your white paper, you write, even with its acceleration as a viable category of venture investment, some investors still think of women's health as a niche uh, industry, despite the fact that women collectively spend as much as $500 billion a year on medical expenses. So why do you think some investors still think this way? And what do you think it will take to change their mind if it's not your paper? I don't know what it was going to change people's mind, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I think the only things, things that change investors' minds is seeing a successful outcome and realizing that they missed out on that successful outcome because they were asleep at the wheel or didn't get it or or for some other reason, Right. Um, so I think that is what is actually going to change, uh, change, you know, investor mindset is, you know, missing something that they want. Um, but the reasons why I think a lot of people sort of uh, dismiss or, or gloss over the impact of women and women's health and women's health in particular is because there, there are so few women around the table when you're talking about healthcare investing. Um, even though we've seen companies like Kind Body, Maven Health, Tia, et cetera, grow to these, you know, be these massive private companies now, I think we're still in the earliest days of women's health um, as a viable category. And it's been held up by not enough women around the table and not enough understanding of by the, the often men who are around the table that women's health is important. It's it's multi-layered, it's nuanced. It's not just periods, pregnancy, and fertility. 
Um, it also, and you know, now we can we can put menopause in that category because now there has been some elevated interest in menopause. But you know, you think about things like gut health and mental health and hormonal health, and all of those things are very in interesting and make up a really interesting pastiche of of women's health categories and companies. Um, now, you know, I have a lot of thoughts around whether everything needs to be a point solution, um, meaning that, you know, I don't think uh, like a platform for just PCOS or just a very small, um, you know, uh, disease state makes a lot of sense as you, as it, as it grows. Um, we really want to look at big TAM opportunities. Um, but uh, I think acknowledging that women's health is not just like, you know, three different things. It's actually a number of things. Um, and then, you know, growing and investing accordingly. I, I want to call out, there was a, a paragraph in the paper. I'm going to pull it up. Um, you say like other demographic categories, women are not a singular market. Young women, 18 to 24, women of color, older women, moms, single professional women. These are all, uh, re all represent different and occasionally overlapping cohorts and opportunities within the broader market. And I love that you bring that up because again, I just want to remind people, it's not like we are just talking about a women, <laughs> a woman. There's so many ways for yeah. us to think about women and their power and, and the different demographic segments within that group that we call women. Um, I wanna shift us to talk about a little bit different topic, uh, which is AI. And so you also write in your paper that as highly educated members of our white collar workforce, as well as the majority of our healthcare and caregiving workforce, women will be uniquely impacted by the revolution in large language models and artificial intelligence. So how can investors and founders be part of fueling the innovation for women who will be impacted by AI? Well, I think even, even OpenAI acknowledges that there will be jobs that are impacted by and, and often completely either eliminated or changed by, um, by AI and by large language models. Um, a lot of that change and elimination will come in uh, high earning white collar jobs, which, you know, as we just discussed, highly educated women, highly educated workforce coming out of college, going into high earning white collar jobs, right? And so we have to be really thoughtful about the ways that one, AI can accelerate those careers, but also the ways that they will, in some cases, eliminate those careers. Um, where I see the opportunities though, are the fact that healthcare is an area where you will almost always need a human touching a human at some point to provide healthcare. And healthcare is a category that is uniquely dominated by, by women. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Certainly there are opportunities where um, AI can, you know, work alongside healthcare professionals. There's a company called Notex that uses artificial intelligence to, um, to translate the, the back and forth that a patient and a, and a nurse or a doctor might have uh, and translate that into, into notes that aren't, aren't being taken by hand. And I think that's a really amazing and, and important way of using AI and kind of making medical professionals more, uh, more useful and, and, and freeing them up to actually have, more, have better patient interactions. Um, so there are these categories where uh, women over-index in, in, in employees uh, and where AI will be an accelerant and not, you know, not, not necessarily pull back uh, the progress. Yeah, and I, I also love seeing um, the innovation from women and underrepresented communities in AI so that they're bringing their lens to how AI, again, better serves people and thinks about people first and centering their problems and, and not just trying to put together a solution that has a bunch of uh, catchy buzzwords or, again, shrinks and pinks a solution. Yeah. Um, all right, before we head into your high level reflections, I want to shift to yet another topic because listen, Monique has so many <laughs> thoughts and so many different things. I'd love to hear your thoughts about women founders getting access to funding. And so you wrote public companies with female CEOs outperformed the stock price of those with male CEOs by 20%. 
within the first two years of a woman taking leadership. Yet in 2021, a year that broke the record for the most IPOs led by women, still only 0.01% of all US IPOs were led by female CEOs. And, and as you bring up in, in the white paper, we know about the abysmal funding going to uh, women founders. And then even worse, if it's a company founded by only women. So I'd love to hear from you, what are some of your reflections about um, women getting more access to funding and then being able to get to that point where they can lead these public companies? Yeah, I mean, I, it's the current market environment has unfortunately put us set us back even further. Um, I know that at Cake Ventures, more than half of the companies that I've invested in have female CEOs um, and female leadership. Uh, I don't think that's the case for you know a lot of the funds out there. And I think it's unfortunate that a lot of investors have sort of retrenched and retreated to their, their old networks in order to, to do deals and uh, invest in companies. Uh, I think, you know, the the innovation of women and female-led companies is really strong and it needs really strong investors. I think the more women, the more women VCs that are out there, the more we're able to um, support and invest in great female founders. However, that does come at some risk. Um, you know, there was the Harvard Business School study that said that uh, female-led companies that were invested, invested almost exclusively invested in by female-led investors found it really difficult to raise their next round of funding. And so that's something that I think about for the companies in my portfolio um, in, a, in a very clear way. Um, you know, I always try to have male investors on the cap table. I always try to, you know, well, I'm having great female co-investors. I always try to find a male investor to pull in. And I think, unfortunately, we have to do things strategically until the world changes and until the world shifts. Um, so unfortunately, you have to play the game that's on the field um, and try to push for the game that you want to see on the field tomorrow, right? Um, from a female founder perspective, what I would say is to continue building you know, the biggest most impactful companies that you can really have a big vision and don't be afraid to share that vision, right? Don't go in and, and play small, really play big um, and really try to create the biggest companies that you can. And for those people who miss out on your vision or don't get it, you know, use spite as a, as a accelerant. There's, there's nothing better than spite. <laughs> She said, listen, play petty, okay, when you're on these deals. <laughs> I, am, I am the pettiest person. I am very petty. <laughs> oh, Monique, I love you. We've got skincare. We've got pettiness. I'm into it. Um, I So we're going to head into a quick round of reflections from Monique before we open it up to audience Q&A. But I just wanted to echo um, my my commitment to seeing that change, right? And our commitment here at All Raise and, and, and how privileged I feel to be part of a community that recognizes where we are, wants to leverage the power of male allyship and working with other women and non-binary investors to move this industry in a direction that I know will benefit all of us. So I just wanted to thank you for your work there, Monique, and, and all the folks in our community for doing this work. We're, we're moving in the right direction, but we have a lot of work to do. Um, all right, so Monique's high-level reflections is a little bit more of uh, a lightning round. So Monique, what were three of the most surprising key insights that you learned and how do you apply them as an investor? Um, I think one of the most, uh, one of them was the, uh, the, the stat that two women will soon earn a grief for every one man. Um, another was the size of the women's healthcare market. And another was the categories that artificial intelligence might not impact as as much, right? And I think, you know, I've certainly taken all of those into account in my investments. One of my recent investments is a company called Ellie Health, women's healthcare company that helps you monitor your hormones on a on a much more regular basis, squarely in the women's health market. Um, I've invested in an AI company that uses AI to for training and skills development and healthcare and and service level jobs. Uh, often with, of which are, you know, dominated by women. Um, so I think I've already kind of put these insights into motion. Um, and I think the more we can, the more we understand the insights, the more we see them in everyday companies and 
we see them, you know, their influence all over the place. Right. I love it. And so you're already applying these key insights to your portfolio. Okay, folks, she not only came up with the insights, but then she's using the insights immediately. Okay. Um, Which trend from the white paper excites you the most, Monique? Um, what trend I would say I'm really, I'm really excited to see the consumer market evolve. Um, this isn't from the white paper, but I did tweet about it this morning. I am actually really interested in this pinky doll from TikTok. I mean, I think that is such, uh, an interesting use of TikTok and a consumer platform. Can and you I- tell me, I'm sorry, I'm very out <laughs> of the loop here about this pinky doll business. So can you please tell me what this is? <laughs> So she's this TikTok creator who is basically being like an NPC gaming character and, you know, earning micro payments within TikTok um, for just being herself and her personality. Uh, and P- a, lot, a lot of people have been talking about, oh, this is the demise of the internet. What happened to the innovation? And I'm like, the internet has always been this, where people do weird things on the internet and then it becomes a thing. Um, and so I'm really interested in this, this consumer shift um, I'm always like interested in in the ways that people are now using something differently, and I think I think this this points to something potentially around micropayments for creators. Um, I think like that could be a potential explosion, but I also just love the weirdness of it. I'm into I'm into the weirdness of it. Uh, third check mark for this interview: weirdness. <laughs> I'm also into weirdness. And uh, shout out to to Jane for the hookup with the tweet from Monique. <laughs> And I've already started rabbit holing here. I'm going to get out of that because it is time for us to go to audience Q&A. Folks, a quick note. So two things. Number one, if you haven't shared out some of your key insights from Monique's uh, conversation here today or the white paper, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's always great for us to hear um, how this advice has impacted you. And then again, you can share it with your network. And then number two, if you haven't asked a question yet, please go ahead and use the Q&A feature. And I'm going to pull those questions out and start asking Monique. So uh, my very first question that I want to ask you, Monique, actually is about thought leadership. So um, this person says, I love seeing investors share their thought leadership. And this white paper is a great example. What advice do you have for other investors who might be interested in showcasing their thought leadership? Uh, You know, I really started, I started blogging like in the blogger days. Um, Again, I've been on the internet for a very long time. (laughs) Just a few minutes, just a few minutes you've been on the internet. (laughs) Um, And I will say that a lot of almost every big opportunity that I've had come my way has come because I've been a relatively prolific writer in some capacity. So started in blogging, like early everything, nothing sites back in the day, back in like the nineties, um, moved onto my own blogging platform. And then, you know, now I write very long form white papers and I tweet a lot. And so a lot of that, you know, gave me a high level of visibility. I was tweeting about things that I thought were interesting, companies I thought were interesting, concepts that I thought were interesting. And, um, you know, when I, when I got the opportunity to uh, scout invest at Lightspeed, for instance, it was because Jeremy Liu read uh, um, something that I wrote on Medium and he reached out. He was like, you know, he wanted to get to know me and we had a couple of chats and then he realized that I was leaving 500 startups and he was like, do you want to come scout for Lightspeed? I was like, yeah, I do. That'd be great. Um, and so like those types of opportunities come when you put yourself out there and put your thoughts out there. It's not helpful to anyone if you just kind of hoard thinking and hoard perspectives. People will like it or they won't like it or they'll disagree with you. And I, all of that is fine, but you have to get out of your own way and like really put those things out there in a way that is accessible to people so that the people who support you will know how to find you. And I mean, no big deal. Jeremy was the first, Jeremy Liu was the first investor in Snap. Is that right? The parent company to Snapchat? Snap, investor in a firm. Uh, he had a he had a pretty good run. <laughs> he had a pretty good run. Okay. So <laughs> if Jeremy Liu is looking at your stuff and he's like, hey, you want to come do some stuff? It's not a small thing. So I just want to make sure that Flex was fully articulated here for us. <laughs> um, and for you, Monique, let's head on over to our second question. Uh, Dana, thank you for that question. Um, and this person, feel free to correct me in a, de- a direct message if I pronounce your name incorrectly. And I apologize in advance if I do. But Pian Pian asks, curious, what are the areas 
that you think fall under female economy. And this person shares, I'm the founder of Emotions that improves managers and teams productivity and connections with AI powered coaching and upskilling, providing personalized just in time feedback and resources, which sounds awesome, by the way. Yeah, that does sound awesome. Uh, I typically think about, you know, the, the vertical sectors that, you know, that cake invests in, in, in a few different areas. One, consumer internet, the consumer economy, um, two, fintech and financial services, digital health and wellness, and then the future of work, which it sounds like is where your company falls into. Um, and so, you know, the vertical layers of the cake are aging and longevity, increased spending power of women, shift to majority minority. And then if you look across, those are the categories within those layers of the cake. So it sounds like, yes, based on what I'm hearing there, um, a, a really interesting and good fit. I also wanted to call out one demographic shift you just talked about, which is minority to majority. And I think that's a really interesting demographic shift. Can you talk a little bit more about how that, what that is, first of all, for folks and how you think investors should be thinking about that as they're making investments today for an economy that's going to look very different in the next 50 years? Yeah, the U.S. is already um, sort of on the path to shifting to majority minority, or what I like to really call the new majority, right, where people of color, primarily Black, Asian, and Latino, become the majority in the United States and are already a global majority. Um, and so you can see this influence. You can see you can see the influence on TikTok. You can see the influence in companies like We Grocery Delivery, which is Asian and Latino grocery delivery, or companies like City Block Health, which is healthcare for the for the most difficult to serve parts of the population. Um, and so I think if you, you know, if you understand the way that these groups are often driving internet culture, you can look at Black Twitter as an example. You can look at the rise of, of a new app like Spill, right? Which is now kind of siphoning off Black Twitter and, and making it its own thing. Um, you know, you see both the, the, the opportunities and where people are going. And I think that's, it's a, it's a ever increasingly important area of layer of the cake and one which I will probably be writing more about soon. <laughs> it does fit very nicely into cake ventures, <laughs> which by the way, I just, a, a quick side note. Uh, Monique had these cupcakes made for cake ventures that were some of the coolest cupcakes I've ever seen. And I actually took them on a plane home to my family because they <laughs> were so good. So Monique, um, extra points for finding baked goods. <laughs> from, like, <laughs> your brand. All right. Heading on over to our next question. Um, I believe it's Faye Jin. Again, please feel free to correct me. Um, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Faye says, do you think it's helpful to take on a male co-founder to specifically help with fundraise and fundraising and as a face to play the game? I understand wanting, I understand the desire to do that or, or you know, where that thought process comes from, but I think it's so dangerous to, to artificially, um, you know, craft your, your founding team in that way. One it's really easy to get pushed out of your own company if you do that, unfortunately. Um, if an investor for some reason believes in, you know, you're the male shadow co-founder more than they believe in you. Um, I also think you don't want an investor who is swayed by that on your cap table. Um, you don't want an investor who wouldn't invest in you as a CEO, but would invest if there is some now some mythical male co-founder behind you. Um, you don't want it. You don't want that. Um, I actually wrote a little bit about this on my blog a long time ago. It's called The White Elephant in the Room. And it's about the same thing, but just for Black founders. Um, uh, because this has been something that has been discussed uh, over and over again for many years. And I, I would just say, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's the tweet. Don't do it. Um, thank you, Bodique, for sharing your candid advice. And thank you for a fantastic and very honest question, by the way. I really appreciate the candid questions. Keep them coming. Heading on over to Des now. I love hearing you share about your portfolio companies. Is there a certain portfolio company that comes to mind that you feel like other investors feel the pain of missing the opportunity? Would love to hear ones you're excited about um, that you've capitalized on in this economy. Yeah, I mean, all of my portfolio companies are my favorite. 
Um, <laughs> I was going to say, do you want to be recorded live talking about your right, favorite? Right, right. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> They're all my favorite. You know, one that I think uh, a lot of investors did not understand at the seed uh, is a company called Pamper, um, Pamper Nail Gallery. Uh, we had dinner with Vivian, um, you know, that evening that we had, we all had dinner together. And uh, the founder, Vivian Zhu, uh, runs a nail company that does custom uh, press on nails. Um, and so, you know, she can, she, she's done bad bunny nails, she's done Beyonce nails, and she's done, uh, you know, uh, Harry Potter nails. And uh, her company is growing like wildfire. I invested at the seed. She's going to go out and raise a series A and she's going to be a massive company. And she's done, like, I wish I could tell you the kind of revenue that she's done, but uh, a lot of male investors just didn't get it at the seed and even at the pre-seed. Um, and I think it took, um, it took investors who one come from like, uh, you know, nail culture is like women's culture. It's also black women's culture in particular. Uh, and I think it took, you know, my, I'm on the cap table at Cake Ventures and so is Fearless Fund. And I think it took investors like us to understand that. Let me tell you right now, folks, the pan go check out Pamper. Very cool. Um, of course, an incredible founder as well. But I think you're right. It's those unique key insights you can't see if you don't understand the cultural element. And I mean, I, I just got my nails done today. I, I, I think it's such a wonderful experience. And so many of my friends see it as part of culture, not just for fun, but also for professional experiences too. So folks are missing out, but not Monique. She is not missing out. As you can tell, she already knows. I want to head on over to a great question from Laura. I'm in a field that is female dominated, but not typically defined as female. It's mental health. How would you suggest founders in this space talk about it in terms of female markets? I mean, I think just using the data, right? Um, I think if you can dig into data around number of female mental health practitioners, numbers of female health, mental health care patients and really showing the movement of the, um, you know, uh, engagement stats, usage stats, and then, you know, backing that into the economic stats of mental health. Um, I think that's how you would show uh, the potential of the category. I love these uh, tactical pieces. Keep these questions coming, folks. These are great. I'm gonna head over to Jane quickly. What would be your recommendation for a solo female founder who's out raising right now? And, and Jane, let me know. I'm going to scroll down because I think I saw you. Yeah. To clarify, she says, I'm the founder of a vertical SaaS platform and have deep expertise in the space and have built an amazing team. But some thoughts or excuses are, we don't invest in solo founders. So, okay. There's some context there. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people will make that excuse when they don't want to invest or don't see the vision in what you're doing. I think people who want to invest in you and want to see this vision and understand, you know, the potential of what you're building will understand if you're able to build a team. And I think that's what you have to show that you are able to build a team, even though you are a solo founder, you are not a, you know, one person band, right? and that you're able to build a team that can execute to get you to the next milestone and the next milestone after that and so on. Um, and so I think maybe it's, maybe you need to shift the conversation a little bit to show and display the ways in which you've been able to team build, um, hire, you know, really hire excellent people um, and how you'll hire, hire even more excellent people around you as you continue to grow the company, but you know, with this next round of funding. I, I want to dig into that a little bit more, Monique, for just a second. You said something you want to shift the narrative. So let's pretend like we're in a conversation right now. I'm the founder, you're the investor, and you've said, oh, well, hey, listen, we don't really focus on investing in solo founders. How, how might I, as the founder, then shift that narrative in this conversation so that I can demonstrate that to you? What would you need to see? You know, if I was the founder, I would say something like that. Like, while I'm a solo founder, I've also been able to bring on, you know, uh, I bring, I've been able to bring on, um, a head of marketing from XYZ major, major company, or I've been able to bring on a CTO from XYZ major company. And these are really, these have, these people have filled out the executive ranks of my company and we've worked really well together. 
um, over the next X, Y, Z number of months and been able to execute on, you know, standing up this feature and this product and going into this market. And so while I'm a solo founder, I don't actually believe that it has hindered me in any way from executing on the business. I mean, just everybody, we're taking notes over here. We're taking notes. I know, I know, Claudia. I know, I know, I know. I see it. I see it. Fantastic. <laughs> Nothing like a pivot in the narrative. Like, ah, I hear you. And um, all right, let's head on over to Emily. What's the best way for entrepreneurs building out a care economy with our businesses to get the attention of VC funding? Currently, we're all bootstrapping. I'm sorry, read that again. Sorry. Of course. What's the best way for entrepreneurs who are building out a care economy business to get the attention of VC funding? Currently, we are bootstrapping. Yeah, I think it's just like any business showing traction and showing the size of the market and that, again, you're able to execute on the vision that you're that you're putting forth. I think bootstrapping is absolutely fine and should not be looked at as, you know, uh, a lesser form of, of being able to company build. I think a lot of people are going to be bootstrapping for longer, um, especially in this current current market environment. And I think that's right because by the time you do get to the milestones that you need to raise that that kind of funding, um, you'll have you know more leverage, better valuations, et cetera. But I think that getting getting the company to a level at which you're able to say, okay, we've been able to prove out uh, some of the key um, the key drivers for our business, and here's what we've learned. And we've been able to bootstrap it to net until now. And here's what we need for the next level of growth to accelerate this. That's the conversation you have to have with investors. Listen, folks, if you're write, write them down, write them down. Yeah, if you want to share there out are the advice, carry many investors out there. There are definitely investors who focus on the care economy. Magnify Ventures is one that you know immediately comes to mind. If you're working on something that is aging and care related, primetime partners. Um, I invest in care as well. It's certainly one area of the cake that I focus on a lot. So, um, you know, going out there and finding who does invest in care, um, you know, is really important and really, and really trying to like curate your investor list to those people who are going to be naturally more predisposed to understanding the care economy. Maybe they've done a care deal or two, um, or they understand, uh, you know, the business model in some way. I, I just wanted to say, listen, already, she's just like, listen, if, if you need some firms, I got firms for you. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm going to take uh, one more question and then I'm going to start wrapping us up here. So Gwyneth asks, do you have recommendations for female BIPOC founders who are pre-revenue with an MVP but need funds to enter the market? In our case, it's to secure a banking partner for credit card and savings account issuance. Banks require a certain amount of funds raised to partner. So Monique, what's your best advice for Gwyneth? Yeah, I think you're in a challenging position. So I think if banks require a certain amount of funds in order to partner, then you're going to have to go out and raise funding, right? And so I think you're going to have to go out and raise um, raise a round of funding. I think that now, I think what I might push back on is how much funding you need or are those banks telling you the truth? <laughs> Potentially not, you know, are there, is there a bank out there that will partner with you without, you know, raising some massive round of funding? There may be. And so you might have to dig a little deeper in order to find those banks and to find those potential partners. Um, but, uh, you know, in lieu of that, I would say, what are the ways that you can show traction without having shown, you know, that you've gone out and raised a massive round um, do you have an amazing wait list? Do you have um, some smaller partnerships that you can point to? You know, what are your early customers saying? You know, are they saying great positive things about you? Um, is there some some level of organic growth that you've been able to to unlock? Um, I would try to think about those before locking yourself into we have to raise this this mass we have to do a massive fundraise in order to get a bank to partner with us. Um, there are lots of different kinds of banks, lots of different kinds of partners. So I would just push back on that just a little bit. Maybe the one or two banks that you talked to said that, but that's not necessarily gonna be true across the board. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Monique, for that advice. I, I have two more questions I wanna sneak in because I just saw them and it, it takes us back to the VC side of things, but I wanna get to them because I love your POV 
on building out firms, uh, Monique. So Emily asks, I built out VC investment teams and find that many women are hesitant to join firms where there isn't already a senior female leader in place to learn and grow from. How do we tackle this in the industry? Big question. Great question, Emily. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. I get that. Uh, you know, there are certainly opportunities for me to join firms where I would have been the only woman at the firm, which sounds terrible. <laughs> It sounds terrible. She's like, I'm going to keep it very 100 with you. It's a hard pass for me. (laughs) (laughs) It it was a pass for me. So I understand that. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go just start a fund then. Never mind. Um, But I do think that at some point, you know, we do have to diversify the ranks of like these all male um, investor tables. And I think that, you know, I think that showing, I think we have to show women some path to the next stage. Like you, if you can't, if you hire an associate who is a woman and you are all male at the top, how is she ever going to see a path for her to be at the top? Right. And I think having, I think one, you have to hire more, more women at the top, not just hire women in junior level investor positions, but also if you are an all male, all all top heavy kind of firm, I think you have to be even more thoughtful and even more, um, you know, put even more action behind giving people a path to the next stage. If the next stage is principal, really map out what this, what the next steps are to get to principal and then what the next steps are to get to um, partner and what the next steps are to get to managing director and really be thoughtful about that and show people that, um, show women in particular that there is a path to these places, even though you don't see anyone there yet. And listen, and shout out, we have these wonderful cohort programs and our VC champions program, which help um, women who are building their careers and venture capital do so. So just wanted to put a plug in and for the, those programs. And we'll be talking about those more soon. Monique, fantastic answer. My last question this time for realsies, before I ask you about your, your final piece of advice to the audience, She, Danielle, would love to hear your thoughts around relationship building with LPs. There's been a discounting in the zeitgeist around emerging managers that started funds in the pandemic due to the unusual circumstances. How have you thought about fund two and fund three and going back to LPs who maybe said no or not yet? Yeah. Um, So I'll tell you what I did in fund one that I hope set me up for, you know, a successful fund two, fund three and beyond. Um, Fund ones are often uh, built on individual investors, you know, we call them high net worth and ultra high net worth investors. Occasionally you might get a family office or two in there, um, but it's often a lot of individual investors. I knew that I didn't have a big network of high net worth individuals in my world. Um, again, I grew up in rural Florida and not, not, a, lot of, not a lot of billionaires there. Um, but uh, I knew that I could use my network to get into uh, LPs, fund of funds that were institutional like or institutional adjacent. So I was able to get in Sendana and Foundry and Plexo Capital and Fairview and Melinda Gates at Pivotal Ventures and, and folks like that. And so that set me up for what I think will be a much more institutional fund too. Um, and I think that's a playbook that a lot of people can can learn from. Yes, it's a longer sales cycle. Yes, it's a lot more like crawling before you're able to walk. But if you, I took the, um, I think this was advice from maybe Charles Hudson at Precursor that I wasn't raising for fund one, I was raising for funds one through three, right? And so taking the time to make sure that I was getting an LP base who would be around for fund two, And that would allow, you know, institutions to come into fund two and then even more institutional in fund three and so on and so forth was how I thought about building out the firm. Ready for your white paper about this. And also (laughs) shout out to Charles Hudson, who we love and adore here. Monique, it's time to wrap up. I want to thank you for your time and ask you, what is your final piece of advice for our incredible audience? You know, I think you should just go out there and take up space in the world and, you know, write amazing things and put your opinions out in the world and put out, um, you know, 
thought leadership, like the, the stuff that I put out or put out, you know, insights around your company um, and decide to build a big company, decide to build a big firm, but whatever you do, just take up a lot of space in the world. A take up space. Monique, we are going to follow you on Twitter, but where else can we find you in the world? Where else can we follow your journey and learn from you? Yes, certainly on Twitter. Uh, I'm there a lot. Um, but if you go to www.cake.bc, you can also find me. Fantastic. Well, Monique, we are so grateful for your time today. Thanks for being here. Thank you.